tent, lightweight tent, sleeping pad, and then, you know, like some clothes, clothes I could bring for this, right? Huh. I wonder if I can stick all that stuff on the bike there. I don't think so. So even with that, that still wasn't enough. And what I want to do is just, like, hand these around, and while I'm talking, you can try to guess, like, what these are. There's three of them. There's yellow, there's blue, and there's red. Okay? And that's, when I get to that point, I'll show you that. Um, okay. So, you know, I first got interested in this thing when I saw that. I came up with the idea, you know, just from that. I was always thinking about it. I actually saw the Race Across America, and the Race Across America is the version that's unsupported. So after seeing, you know, this documentary, I thought, oh, this is one I could actually do, possibly. Okay? made a decision back in the January of 2016 that I was going to do this race, right? I had to tell my wife then, <laughs> right? Break the news, but I didn't do it quickly. I did it over a period of time when she asked, oh, you know, June next year we're going to be doing this. I'm like, well, I kind of won't be around June next year, right? I'll be off doing something out. And then the next thing is getting ready, right? I had to go through a process of getting ready for this. There's a bit to do to get ready, okay? First thing is, trans, the nice thing is Trans Am Bike Race has a website. They have a website that tells you all about the race, what to, some things to expect, the mileage, and you go through and register for that. Okay? Here's the race course. So we know that you're starting in Astoria, ending in Yorktown, Virginia. Right? You get that information from the actual website. Okay? Gives you some race details. Starting 2014, so this is the fourth year of the race. Self-powered, self-supported, so you're expected to go across without like a trailing van. If you did race across America, you would have a trailing van and it would cost you, you know, ten, twenty, thirty thousand dollars. Plus you need a group of people, eight or ten people with you to, to support you. But this one is clock starts June 3rd, 6 a.m. And when you finally get to the end, that's when the clock stops. Right? 4,265 miles. Who here has ridden more than like 50 miles at one time? 100 miles? No, I don't talk about that. 150? 200? 250 in a one day period? Okay, Dennis, this is where you're going to be probably. 285, more than that. Okay? 300? All right. It's <laughs> not more than 300. But who thinks they can ride this distance? Anybody raise? I don't even raise my hand in this because if I thought I had to ride that distance on some of those days out west where the wind was blowing in my face for like 20 miles an hour, 25 miles an hour, or when the temperature was so hot when I was out in Kansas, I would ride in like five miles and then I would stop and look for shade. I remember riding and I would go, okay, I'm going to go five miles and I'm going to look for shade. And I would do that parts of uh, going across Kansas. So the thing was, what's the secret? Oh, I'll just run tw ride 20 miles, and I'll get an ice cream cone. All right, another 20. I'll go get lunch, you know? Maybe if I'm tired, I'll just go to the side of the road and go to sleep, right? That was it. And that was really kind of the, the mental sort of games that you had to play. Sometimes I would think, oh, all right, I got three miles to go. Oh, geez, three miles to go to get to the next turn? Think, well, all right, that's just me riding around the block. And it even got to that point where some of the times it was. It was a challenge just to ride a few more miles, okay? All right? So the other part was climbing 165,000 feet total. So, you know, the same thing. You know, I didn't really think about that. So this distance, I went out and looked. This is the distance from a plane, from you know, flying direct from here to Rome, Italy. This is like climbing the Empire State Building. 132 times, you know, so it's a good distance, good ways up, right? Oh, you go through 10 states. Oh, I've ridden across Connecticut, no big deal. Do that 10 times, huh? Let's see. Hmm, those states are a little bigger, I think, than, than Connecticut, right? Okay. All right, so there's resources out there, right, to learn more about. Besides the website, there are other things out there. There's blogs. This is a guy who did it in 2015. He had a blog out there, and he put down all these things and all the things he learned about when he went and did it. So I picked up a lot of details from him. Okay. YouTube videos. 
other people. This is uh, uh, Nathan Jones, who actually runs the race. He did ride around the world, AG across America. She actually was right, did the race. She started with the race, but then she, in the middle somewhere, she decided she just wanted to get to the end. But those are also, that's a good resource, and I watched that one. And then Jesse Carlson, who won it, I think, in 2015. All right. All right. <laughs> I got to start training it, because before I thought about doing it, maybe I'd ridden 4,000 miles in my whole life, right? <laughs> so here we are with my daughter and my son and me. We're getting ready. And this is like when we just started riding. You know, you barely have a right helmet on, you know? <laughs> and this is in 2015. I look back and I go, oh, what is this? Uh, my kids had done triathlon, so I had some idea of, oh, I'll start riding and start riding. I started riding with them. That was like my initial start. With that. So probably before I had the idea, I probably rode like four or 5,000 miles total in my life before I even thought about going across the country. Okay. So here we got to do it. What's the secret? <laughs> the most part in getting ready, get out there and ride, right? And the group rides are really good in terms of intensity. So for intense rides, I go into the group rides. Long rides, I would ride a bunch of other things. I went out one time, I went to Mount Greylock, rode from here to Mount Greylock, rode up Mount Greylock, and rode back, and that was like 210 miles or something. Uh, Boston 600K. This was, the, this was what I did in 2016, or 15, I don't even remember now. But this one was the indicator to me. If I could finish that, I felt, okay, now I'm ready, I can go and do the whole race. I figure if I can't finish that, there's no reason to register for going across the country, because I'll never make it. Right. So those are some of the things I did for training, getting ready. Ah, then there's Strava. And the nice thing, there's this thing called Trans Am Bike Race Group. So the Trans Am Bike Race gave me an idea. Oh, okay, there's other guys training, and I know they're out there, and I know they're riding a lot of miles. How do my miles get, uh, fit into that? Okay. So I looked at that. I looked at the other riders to see where they were. And if I felt, oh, yeah, okay, I'm in the mix. And I was kind of in the mix. I was probably closer to the top. And I figured... Maybe half the riders use this, half of them don't. So there are other riders out there, of course, that don't use it who are doing well. All right. So then I was looking around, thinking about some possible guys who might ride in the, in the Trans Am in the future. John. And then, of course, Dennis. So I looked and see how many miles Dennis had for last year. 16,000, you know. It's like a small ride, so someday maybe he'll do it, right? That's more mileage than I did last year, even with the Trans Am. So, so it's really good. Take June off, right? What's that? I just need you got to take June off to do it. That's it, right? <laughs> I already blazed the trail for you. You just got to follow what I thought, right? Okay. So, one of the things you have to do is like, all right, where do you go, right? When you're going on this, the Trans Am, how do you know which way to go? There's a few turns, and I'll show you. I'm gonna turn short. Well, what they do is they give you the GPS map. They give you a GPS file. And they have Ride with GPS has that file, and you just got to follow that one, okay? Well, what's missing? Where do you stop? What's out there, right? Where do I know where to stop? How do I know when I'm a good distance from something or not? Because there are, there are points in there where you could go 50, 60, 70 miles without anything. And one of the places right out in Oregon of Mackenzie Highway. Mackenzie Highway is not open for cars until July. So you're riding, kind of riding up there by yourself. There's no stores. There's nothing there, and that's like 60 miles. So you had to make sure you're prepared for that. Okay. So what I did is I went through, and I had to. I couldn't just add the stops. I had to go through and trace it. And it took a while to trace it because there's a lot of turns in there. So I need to figure out where the stops were, and this gives you like the elevation profile. And in the end, I had there are 508 turns on this, a whole trip, and I had to add 281 possible places, post offices. 24-hour gas stations, maybe some hotels, towns. So I figured that, well, if I got to a town, maybe they have a hotel, maybe they don't. I went to some of the towns where, um, you know, I'd ask, oh, where's the hotel in town? We don't have one. All right, where's the post office? Oh, it's right around the corner, so I'd go there. So you really need to do that. You really need to know and have an idea of, like, what is coming up so that you're out there and you're like, uh-oh, I'm, you know, I'm almost out of water. And there were a couple of places where water was a problem. Okay. So I got that. Navigation, that's all set. All right. Now what? What do I bring? Well, I just saw the video. They, you know, that guy's bag, probably his whole bag, everything maybe is this much, maybe not even. All right. All right, how do I set up my bike? Okay, that's one of the big questions. It's like, all right, there's certain things you got to think about. When I set up my bike, what tires do I use? What kind of bike do I use? 
what size tires, how do I set up the handlebars. What about electricity? <laughs> well, if you're going to use paper maps, which I brought paper maps. I brought paper, a printout, but I lost it somewhere, I forget, in Montana. But you need electricity to power your GPS unit. And it's more than just taking, like, you could have, you know, had a big charge back, and then when you stayed overnight, you could have charged it up. But what I did is actually got a, a generator, a hub generator. What am I going to wear, right? <laughs> All right, well, that wasn't too bad. It's like, what are you going to wear? And, and I'll show you that second. Now. And then, how am I going to carry my stuff? So what kind of bags? Well, I watched the, you know, the documentaries, and I saw how, what kind of bags they have, so I had a similar thing. And where will I sleep, right? So it's like, all right, you're going to sleep outside, you're going to sleep in hotels. What happens if you have a breakdown? Do you have to be set up so you can sleep outside? Oh, this stuff. Oh, Scott, you can bring that stuff up here in a minute. So I also, I, <laughs> I, brought the, uh, I brought the bike that I had set up, and it's pretty much back into the way it was. And there are a few things that you would set it up differently than a regular bike. One thing, I put a fender on it because I couldn't stand the rain getting on my back. The other thing, it has a generator hub in the front. It has generator light in the back. So just turn the wheel, of course. It has a USB charger. You need to be able to charge your electronics. I took the handlebars and I pushed them up like a couple of inches and tried to make it even with the seat. Because one of the things that happens is the racers riding a long time, they, they call, well, you get pain in your joints. But it's Shermer's neck where you can no longer hold your head up. So I tried to make it as, as high as possible. I also put fold down. Uh, arm rests for, my, uh, for the uh, arrow bar. And the reason is, is I could have more places to grip. So I felt that this was a pretty good setup for that. Okay. So that's kind of the uh, main points of the bike. The other thing was, you know, what tires do you use, what side width tires do you use, what type of pedals and what type of shoes. I took and did these, I'm actually wearing the shoes, but I had the SPD type because I felt, oh, Sometimes my legs are going to be dead, maybe I'm going to want to walk a little, maybe I'm going to have to walk a little. So I felt that that was better than using straight cycling shoes. Okay. So let's see where are we? Oh, we already did this one, I kind of went backwards. Oh, so. What happened? Oh, yeah, right there. The red one? Remember? Yes. Are you doing what guesses? Yes. Ranger. Oh, I'm guessing Jimmy Sack. Yeah, this one is, this is a inflatable pad. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> so this is an inflatable pad, full body. If you're ever going to do a ride across the country like that, I recommend you do not bring this. <laughs> I inflated it one day, and then after I was so tired, I didn't feel like inflating it again. And then I used it just as a mat. And then after a while, I got holes in it. So it didn't matter, right? So I would recommend you don't do that. What, what, what was it for? This is an inflatable uh, pad. Oh, a sleep on. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Whole body one. So it actually, it was fairly good until I sent it home, and then I started sleeping in post offices, and then I wished I had it because it's a hot. You gotta sleep on the floor of the post office. Yes. Yeah. Usually you're so tired, it didn't make a difference. I used their map. This one, blue one. Did you say? Yep. Here's the S. This is the it's a Escape. They call it SOL, but that's the name of the company. So this is Baby Sack, and this is supposed to be waterproof. I didn't sleep out in the rain, so I didn't find out. But with this, you get rid of this. You get rid of this. And with this, of course, you don't bring this pad. Although, you know, maybe a thinner version of this might have been good. And then the last one. I already got my sleeping down vest. Yeah, well, it's, it's close. Yeah, it's not a down vest. It's a, it's a lightweight down jacket. Another thing that I would not bring <laughs> next time. because I was fortunate that it didn't get wet, but this is just a jacket. It kept me very warm, but if this had gotten wet, it would have been just miserable. miserable. Yeah, it would have been brutal to carry this. So I think the next thing would be have multiple layers. So that's kind of that. That's my gear for the... Uh, um, you know, for the bike, that's what I brought. Those things, plus a couple of other things. Oh, wait. I got my cycling concepts thing. That's the advertisement for it. <laughs> so I rode this, rode across the country with this thing on. You know. 
I don't know how many customers you'll get from it. Either. <laughs> kind of a, a good distance. Okay. So when you're when you're going and setting up your bike and getting everything ready and figuring out what kind of gear you're going to have, you have to think about a few things. You think about comfort, right? You want to make sure you're comfortable as much as possible. At least setting up the bike, like I said. Oh, I also double wrapped the, the uh, handlebar tape. So you want to make your bike comfortable because you're going to be on for hours. Right. Weather, right? You have to have weather gear. It's going to be cold. It's going to be hot. It's going to be rainy. It's going to be windy. Durability, right? You want it to be durable, especially <clears throat> tires. I had eight flat tires along the way. And all of them happened before I got to Wyoming, Lander, Wyoming. And I changed my tires to gator skin, and I didn't get a flat the rest of the way. Really? Yeah. Aerodynamics. Hmm. Interesting one. Aerodynamics, how fast do you think I'm going on this thing? Not very fast, maybe 15, maybe going 20, but that's 25, 30 downhill. When I'm riding straight along the road, I'm probably going 15. You know what the real issue here is? The wind. The wind in some places is so strong that you're like, oh my gosh, you wish you had like nothing. Weight, right? So I, right off the bat, I got rid of this stuff because it's too heavy, right? So I wanted to make it lightweight, so that's why I picked that S Web BB sack, which has actually worked out really well. And your goal. All right? What's your goal for this race? You want to try to win? You want to try to finish? Now you'll find out there's guys in there trying to win. Me, I was like, you know what? I'm not gonna I'm not gonna ride 18 hours a day and then you know ride off the road or something. I said, I'll put a reasonable goal on there, finish, try to do a reasonable time, and I think pretty much achieve what I want to do. Okay. There's the bike. This was actually the point. So I was supposed to show you the bike. Get a little early, which is okay. But there's the bike set up, essentially that. And there's one other thing here. Spot tracker. When you go through this, when, with the spot tracker, you can actually, anybody who can go online and see you, this is a satellite tracker, can see where you are at any point. And it updates every, like, 15 minutes or something. Like that. So that worked out well. People could watch, you know, where I was actually at certain points. Okay. Am I ready? Oh, gee, I don't know. Time's coming. It's coming. You actually have to register by January 31st of that year, so like four months before. Okay, right, made the decision then. So over the next year and a half, I did like 18,000 miles, did like 900,000 feet. I was so concerned about the, the going up the mountains that I thought, oh, I'll do a lot of climbing. So I got about 900,000 feet over that period of time. I got all my gear. I prepared uh, my maps, so I'm hopefully ready to go. Okay. So, got my hat, I'm ready to go. This was it, this is what you get for competing. This is the prize. There's no money, there's nothing. But everybody gets this, which is good. You get a hat, right? Okay, so this is the race. This is a recording of the race. So, you know, you hope you brought sleeping gear and stuff. It's, it's gonna be about 25 days for me to get across there. Oh, well, you know what? I did do one thing. I sped it up 32,000 times. So every second of this is worth now about nine hours. So here we go. And SM is mine, you can see. Oh, there's the two mic pick show. Right there. Those are people who have like gotten in the airplane, they've got to turn their thing off. <laughs> You can see a lot of them are kind of left at the beginning. They kind of stopped and got out. Yeah. It's like one minute to me. Okay. The first person to get there, yeah, he's sitting there about uh, now. Seven, twenty. So. I'm in there. I'm coming up. I'm going to right now. You're talking. Near the border, so I'm at Virginia now. So I'm at the end there. That's about a minute of replay. So that's kind of that's it. You know, you could you could have seen this real time. Of course, it wouldn't have gone so fast, but that's a sped up version of it. Okay. Results: 130 started, 62 finished. Evan Deutz, he, he was. This is his third race. He ran, this is the third time he's raced it. First time he's won it. He has the record now, the 17, hour, 17 days and 9 hours. 
and mine. All right, I'm a few days. I'm like a week behind him. So we got had weeks. So he's doing like seventy miles a day, sixty or seventy miles a day more than me. So I did that, 172 miles a day on average over the 25 days. What does that get me? 25th. So you saw a lot of guys out there doing more than that, you know. So that's kind of the results. But let's see. Let's look at a little more detail. Are there racers like that from around the world? Amy from Colorado, a lot of experience riding. There's Mike from uh, Florida. These, and some of the days I spent with them. Brian from uh, Switzerland, he actually had done RAM. <laughs> and he has like the record of going around Australia or something, something he was telling me about. Anton, who's from Sweden, and uh, Rolf, who's from uh, Switzerland. I rode with these guys, and Mike was one day, it was really interesting. We were at a, hotel, um, a motel, we had shared a motel, a few of us. And Mike says, let's go and get across Colorado this morning. We're going to get across the whole state. And it's like 270 miles. I'm like, oh, all right. So we got up at 1 o'clock in the morning. I made it about 35 miles. And I'm like, you know what? And Brian was with us, too. I said, ah, I'm done. You guys keep going. And I just went to the side of the road and went to sleep. And those guys kept going. When it got light, woke up, started riding. I made about 20 miles. And there's Brian on the side of the road sleeping. Except, except there's no place where he stopped. There was, there, you know, it was really steep. And there's no place on the side of the roads to stop. So he's like halfway in the road, you know, with his helmet, with his little blinking light on top of his helmet. So, so it was an interesting, interesting part. And uh, Roth, Roth, really strong rider. He was. We had. Um, there was a, a woman. I'll show you shortly. We had gone through uh, Chinook, Kansas, and there was a woman who, who was there. One of those dot watchers. She came up, and I'm sitting there and, uh, eating some of my Subway sandwich, and she says, oh, you just eat more? I go, oh, yeah. She goes, oh, yeah, there's a storm coming. You know, I already met Ralph. I told He's going to go to Gerard, and you, where are you going to go? Are you going to go all the way to Gerard? And I'm like, no, nah, I don't want to go all the way to Gerard. And I'm going to go, what other choices I have to this little town called Walnut, Walnut, Kansas, that has a post office. Oh, great, that's all I need to go. So I just went there, and I rode off, went to Walnut, stayed at the post office. A couple hours later, Roth opens the door, comes in. And he said, what are you, I thought you went to Gerard. And he says, no, he went to the bar. There's one bar in town, there's nothing else in town. There's a bar, post office, and like a few houses. And he was in there and he says, oh, I just stayed there and there were American guys buying me drinks or whatever. All right. But he's a really strong rider. I was lucky to stay with him for a while. Later on, in the, later on near the end, kind of near the end, last few days, he says, oh, let's go catch up to those guys up in front. And I said, no, nah, Ralph, you know, I just want to finish the thing. <laughs> I'm not going to kill myself to try to catch up to him. He went off and he finished like a day and a half ahead of me or something. But, but it was good. Good experience. Okay. People along the way. There are quite a few people I met along the way. You know, these, this, they own a Newton Bike Shop. If you saw the uh, Inspired to Ride video, these are the owners. Here's a guy who was riding along. I saw him out in uh, Kentucky. And he's riding along. And I could see him off in the distance in front of me. And I'm, you know, it's a, I'm pretty lonely, you know by myself. You know. Nobody's around. So I eventually I caught up to him. We rode for a while. It was, it was pretty good. But that was that was one of the things. Here's Karina Cox. She was the one in Chinook, Kansas, who actually told us about the storm. And it was the same storm that one of the riders actually didn't uh, didn't make it through. Here's another one. He was from uh, Kansas also. Uh, this is Steve. And this is a woman that was on top of the uh, uh, Blue Ridge Parkway. And she says, I'm riding along, riding along. She yells at the window, hi, I'm the, we're the angels of the parkway, or whatever. <laughs> and she stopped with her husband, and they gave us, you know, gave us some treats. And this guy, this guy's another guy out near Missouri, Farmington, Missouri. He was uh, Wayne, and he rode with me for a while, too. So there's a lot of people along the way. This is only a small subset of the people I met and rode with. Okay. Ah, beautiful scenery you get. You know, you go out there, you see this? This is in, uh, this is uh, Mackenzie Pass, all volcanic rock, Yellowstone Park. There's Astoria, and it was in a, a rainbow, so I took a picture of this. I don't remember where this was, Montana or something out west, somewhere where it's flat, okay? Ah, great, you know? Beautiful trip, all these wonderful experiences, you know? No problem. Oh, well, I forgot. Oh, you also get some fame. Not a lot, you know, like Taylor Swift or somebody like that. But at least on the trail, you know, people, oh, you're racing? Oh, yeah. And they give you a thumbs up and things. And actually, in Oregon, there's actually people, you know, cheering for you. And after, when you get to Kentucky, then, of course, you know, 
not cheering for you. They don't want you there. <laughs> okay. Challenges, right? I figured there's a bunch of challenges. I picked out the top ten. Wind, right? A lot of times you're riding into the wind. And one of the stories they told me is that if you lose track and you don't know which way to go, one of the, one of the other riders says, he says, just point your bike into the wind and that'll be the right way. Right? <laughs> okay, temperature, rain. So you had to figure that you're going to go all the way down 32 degrees Fahrenheit and all the way up to 100, which it was. So you, you know, you got to figure out what gear you're going to bring uh, for that. Okay? Rain. This is actually, I didn't know about it, but this was a tropical storm that was coming through when I went through Kentucky. So it was really raining real heavily and I'm like, oh, the rain's got to stop at some point. I kept riding, rode through it, but so you had to prepare for that rain. Right? You're going to get wet. Okay, high elevations. This is outside of, um, this is in Idaho. This is outside of uh, Whitebird, Idaho, and kind of road goes like this. And during the whole trip, I fell down twice. <laughs> Once, I was riding up this thing, and I was trying to charge my uh, phone my, with my charger, and the cable got stuck in my wheel. And I wasn't going very fast, fortunately. And I, uh, I fell over there. I didn't get hurt. Fortunately, it wasn't like, you know, hit by the car or something. And I said, like, a loneliness, right? You're out there riding for hours on end. You're by yourself. I got some music on an MP3 player, and then I, I lost my MP3 player. But fortunately, eventually I got to Walmart. I knew there was a Walmart in one of the towns in Colorado, in Breckenridge, Colorado. So I went and bought another one. Okay. Second challenge is water. Two places where I really had, I brought... 64 ounces plus I brought an extra bottle if needed. Two places where I ran out of water, and actually there were three. There was one in Oregon where I ran out of water, but I brought uh, the iodine tablet, so I was able to purify it. And then in Colorado, out going into Puebla, I ran out of water. And I looked, I didn't think it was a big issue, because I was looking on the map and I could see brooks and streams going under the highway. And then I got to it, and I looked down. And on the map it shows blue, you know, nice. You look down and there's a little trickle of water. And there's no way I'm going to drink that, right? I would, I'd be better off. But fortunately, I made it. Mechanical failures, I had three issues when I was going. One, I had flat tires because, it, it, as it turned out, I found this really tiny piece of metal in one of my tires. But I got the, I had eight flat tires before I got the Lander, Wyoming. And then when I got in there, I found there was a bike shop on the route. Just sit off, you know, throw those in the trash. Give me some uh, gator skins. The other problem I had shifting. My bike wasn't shifting right, and as it turned out, it was because I had pressure on the front cables. And when I finally sent my pad home, the problem went away. <laughs> I had tied it up there, and I actually brought it to one of the bike shops, and they were looking at it, and they, they didn't think of looking at the front of it. They were just looking at the back, trying to figure out why it's not shifting right. And I just said, I'll oh, forget it. You know, I'll, I'll go with a few gears. It still has a little problem. But once I sent that back, the problem went away. The other one was a USB charger. I was about 100 miles away to the end, and my USB charger stopped working. My, I lost my paper map, so all I had is my, my uh, GPS. So what I did, I actually had this little charger that I brought to, that had batteries. So you could buy standard batteries in it, and it would be a USB charger. So I was using that for a while, and then it was getting dark, and that was actually the 27th, and I was getting close to the end, and then I dropped it, and the batteries fell out, and I could only find three of the batteries. <laughs> So a tow truck driver came by, and he goes, I want to ride, and I go, well, I can't really get a ride, you know, I'm going to race, and he says, I said, are there any gas stations coming up? And I actually knew there was a gas station in 10 miles, he goes, ah, it's going to be closed, though, I'm like, I don't care, I know they have soda machines, and I just went up there and plugged in for a while. So I spent an hour there, then I spent an hour a little further. So those are kind of the three issues, not really severe, the flat tires are more discouraging than anything else. Oh, one way. And then, dogs. We had a lot of dogs. They, yeah, they don't care, you know. Like I, I kind of think they don't like bikers going by some of the houses in Kentucky. And I'll just show you one of the things. Here's a video somebody took. This was a racer who finished a little bit late, uh, back. What we would do is when we when we found um, when we got Wi-Fi, we'd connect up, we'd look at Facebook, and they'd give us a lot of information on Facebook about what's going on. And one of the things that kept coming up was dogs, dogs, dogs. He got through it, and that's the first dog he, he saw. And he took a video of it and says, are these the dogs you guys are talking about? <laughs> <laughs> that dog laying in the road. He's like, no, the dogs we're talking about are the ones who... Oh, 